Okay, I think we'll get this party started. Congratulations. Are we, are we good? Okay, all right, well, congratulations. You made it to the policy work group update. Uh, if you, I say congratulations. If you are here to learn more about Kubernetes policy and compliance, it means that you probably have achieved elite status in your career where you can tell people what to do, and if they don't listen, you can write code that forces them to do it. So, welcome. Uh, I guess we'll do a quick round of introductions. My name is Robert Ficalia. I'm CTO of Sunstone Secure, and we specialize in Kubernetes security and compliance. I'll pass it on to Jim. I'm Jim Baguadia, co-founder and CEO at Nirmata. We are in the Kubernetes policy and governance space. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to our session. Uh, I am Jaya Ramanathan. I'm a distinguished engineer at Red Hat. I've been working in the security compliance and governance space for uh, many, many years now. So excited to share uh, share the direction we, are, we want to take. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Thursday. My name is Anka Seiler. I'm from IBM, and I'm in research leading the governance, risk, and compliance field. So what do we do in the policy work group? Uh, so our charter initially was to help define the architecture, the designs, the nomenclature, if you will, for policy in Kubernetes, and, and of course, supporting the ecosystem in CNCF. And I think it's Martin Fowler who once pointed out that there are really only two hard problems in software, naming things and something to do with caching. Anyway. <laughs> the jokes don't get better. Uh, but we have been busy uh, trying to define uh, a common uh, output for policy reports. Um, we've defined a white paper that lays out a policy architecture that we'll be speaking to shortly. And we're hoping to uh, invite the community in, the vendor community, the projects, the sub-projects, to discuss how policy framework can uh, fit together and support the different services in a, in a way that meets compliance, regulatory requirements, but also, in, in general, knowing how your system is going to run in a declared state and making sure that the declared state matches the actual state. Um, one of our uh, uh, efforts to date has been to align this with other industry groups uh, so that the, the policy construction, policy enforcement can be reused in many different industries. And one of those uh, efforts is a, a project sponsored by NIST in the US called OSCAL. And we'll talk a little bit more how our efforts have aligned with that OSCAL uh, schema and how it helps enforce policy and distribute the results of those policies uh, across systems. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to Jim. All right, thank you, Robert. Yeah, so just one, one quick thing I want to add, like within the CNCF, there's various types of organizations, right? So you have technical advisory groups that span multiple projects. You have you know, the special interest groups or SIGs that are focused on particular areas within a project like Kubernetes. And then you have working groups that are also cross-functional and report into multiple SIGs, right? So from that landscape perspective, like Robert explained, our charter is to figure out for Kubernetes policy and governance, what exactly does that mean? What is needed? How do we align across you know, all different concerns within Kubernetes? So one of the things we did about a year or so ago is we wanted to publish a paper that talks about what Kubernetes policy management is. And we use reference architectures from the industry, from authorization. There's the exact mill architecture that we leverage. And to define the terminology here, within Kubernetes or within a cloud native system itself, you have multiple policy enforcement points. And of course, all of us are running, you know, if you're running Kubernetes, you have multiple clusters. So that's where you would enforce policies in Kubernetes. You have extensible admission controllers, which lets policy engines like Kiverno and OPA Gatekeeper you know, function uh, and add customizable policies there. So given these uh, policy you know, enforcement points, and keep in mind, you might want to enforce policies in your CI CD pipeline, also at you know, runtime, as well as at admission controls. Then you need a policy administration point, which is managing policies across your fleets of clusters, or just, you know, just the different environments like staging, dev test, QA, et cetera. Um, and finally, you have, you know, you want to enrich policies with information. This could be from within the cluster, like through the API server, could be from external data, 
because policy decisions have to be made very fast, typically in a couple of seconds at admission controls. So you need to bring in the right data to policies. Anyway, so the paper is available, you know, and we this is a live document. It's managed in our GitHub repo. So feel please do give it a read, give you know, post your feedback. We are looking at evolving the paper and we will publish a V2 uh, fairly soon, right, with some learnings and as Kubernetes evolves as well. Another aspect I want to quickly touch on, and this is a project we completed, um, and it's ongoing as well, is to define a custom resource definition. So as most of you probably know, Kubernetes is designed to be extensible. It allows you to, you know, using OpenAPI v3 schema, define custom resources. And those resources act like, you know, native, you know, constructs like pods and worker nodes, et cetera, which can be managed through the Kubernetes API. So we added a custom resource definition to collect policy results and format them into reports, which could be you know, extracted through the Kubernetes APIs. The benefit here was to standardize the way Kubernetes policy results are retrieved, because if you look at Kubernetes security, there's a broader set of concerns, right? You have runtime security, at one end of the spectrum. You have you know, configuration security, which can be applied, again, at admission controls in your CI CD pipelines. You have things like you want to verify signatures and attestations for software supply chain security. You have other things like you might want to do vulnerability management and periodically check if each image has an up-to-date you know, vulnerability report. Software build of materials is also becoming very important. So all of these concerns have to come together. And typically what we saw previously is every policy engine had a different way of reporting results. So standardizing this allowed you know, the, um, the, any operator to retrieve these reports through the Kubernetes APIs itself in a very standard format. So this again is something that we're maintaining within the working group. We've also sponsored several adapters so as you see, Kiberno, which is a Kubernetes policy engine, uh, Kubebench, which does CIS benchmarks, there's Trivi, which does you know, vulnerability management, Falco and KubeArmor for runtime security. So covering all those different aspects we talked about. And then there's reporting and translation tools that build on the standard. Uh, so the reporting is done by Policy Reporter, which is a sub-project of Kiberno. And the translation is uh, you know, a contribution from an IBM team which takes uh, the standard report in the policy for a CRD format and converts it into OSCAL. So lots of interesting things coming up and, and that's the benefit we see of standardizing here which allows other layers of tools to be built in this chain. So those are two of the you know, projects that we uh, have completed. You know, next, Jaya is going to talk about some of the upcoming projects, um, and we'll look at some details there. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, so as Jim uh, and Robert outlined, uh, the focus of the work group so far has been to define uh, overall architecture for policy management and kind of also standards of how the various policy engines can report their results. Uh, because, you know, we can all agree that uh, there's not going to be a single policy language out on the planet, right? There are going to be multiple and uh, we have to deal with that. Um, so then the, what we are focusing on right now is why do customers do policy management? They do it because it is a, it is a means to an end. And so what is the end goal, right? So the various end goals. One could be, you know, maintaining continuous security readiness and audit readiness. Another goal is to comply to regulatory compliance standards. A third goal is to reduce the operational cost of operating the environment, right? Because as people know, right, uh, what uh, teams, application teams just want to deploy their workloads and get their uh, applications going. So security compliance becomes like an afterthought. And so the more we can make it easy for them uh, to accomplish that by minimizing the operational cost, I think that's important. So that's where governance comes into play. So the two focus areas that we are uh, 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 focusing on next are one is to produce a draft paper on Kubernetes governance. Because the term governance is used in so many different contexts, so we want to kind of highlight what do we mean by that and how policy management can help you achieve that goal. 
And the second one is to bridge the Kubernetes policy management concepts to compliance management, because uh, NISTAS has standards such as OSCAL related to compliance, and we want to bridge the two and uh, kind of articulate you know, how you can automate compliance by applying the policy management approach. So those are the two areas. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, Kubernetes governance. So if you think about a cloud platform and uh, customers or uh, cloud providers managing the cloud platform, they have to comply to various uh, standards, both internal standards as well as external regulatory compliance standards. And these standards could pertain to security, resiliency, software engineering. And what they really want to do is to get that done by minimizing the cost to do it and then also minimizing the risk and also be ready for audits and so on. So that's really what they are trying to do. And what that means is, if you think about uh, an enterprise, there are so many different personas who are interested in this topic, right? You have the site reliability engineers or administrators who are actually managing the platform. You have the SecOps people who are focused on security aspects. You have compliance engineers who have to produce evidence for audits. And you have the CISO who is setting the enterprise standards, security standards, and so on. So you have all these different personas, and they all come into play. And then if you look at how things are done today, it's almost like you know, they are kind of operating in some island, and they all kind of come together when they have to get ready for an audit. Everybody is scrambling, right? So what we really are trying to do is to use the GitOps and those kind of methodologies to ensure that those kind of personas can actually collaborate on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so that this whole thing becomes like a more auto autonomous governance approach so that we can always be security ready and audit ready. And even if we can achieve that goal for a subset of the controls, I think that's still a big win because you're now reducing the operational cost at least for those set of controls. So that's really what uh, we are looking at. And the how is, we want to represent the best practices as policies, and we want the policies to be managed as source code in Git, just like any other source code. And then you have tools available so that all these different personas can be involved in how those policies are defined. And then um, they get deployed using GitOps, and then um, you have a regular uh, monitoring on the posture with respect to the various policies. You detect violations. You remedy the violations automatically when, whenever possible, or in some cases, you know, if you have to follow a, a IT process, fine, you can open service now tickets or uh, to get that uh, automation rolled out. And, uh, and also you can do some analytics to fine tune the policies, right? So I think that's the overall approach. And the benefit of doing all this is, as I said, you result in day-to-day -day collaboration between all the stakeholders and personas who, uh, who need to be involved. You reduce the operational cost by automating things. And you also have the SMEs who are knowledgeable about the various aspects actually authoring the policies. Because you can't expect an SRE to be uh, an expert in all aspects of security and resiliency and so on, right? So there are various people who have that expertise and you want to bring them through the GitOps methodology so they actually are, are doing this. And we also want to do this in a more open fashion so we have a project called Open Cluster Management, which is a CNCF sandbox project. And we want to kind of use that as a way to kind of define these policies and uh, collaborate and um, a community approach. So a, a call for all of you here. So I'm, I'm really glad to see this crowd. Um, so the call and request is, you know, come and participate and help us progress this. Because I think by collaborating, we can all contribute and um, uh, tackle this uh, a difficult problem. Thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Anka. Thank you, Jaya. Okay. So let's see. Jaya just mentioned that uh, we try to align with uh, standards and you know with the open community for collaboration. So the standard that we are looking at here is the NIST standard for compliance as code. Uh, it's called OSCAL. It stands for Open Security Control Assessment Language and has two major parts. One is the machine readable language itself. It provides about seven or eight schemas that correspond to the various compliance artifacts that the 
um, the uh, various personas in compliance will manage. Uh, you see down in the uh, figure the catalog, the profile, you may know this also as a baseline, um, a component definition that carries the mapping between the high level uh, regulatory controls and the technical controls, the assessment plan, assessment results, and plan of action and milestones. So hopefully there the English name is clear enough. Uh, the second part is the framework with automated uh, support for automated traceability. Meaning that at the end of the day when I get a result or I'm talking about uh, fixing a control in a plan of action and milestones, I, we are not talking about a label in some spreadsheet somewhere. It is all traced back to the catalog that we originally started with. So if you are reading NIST, you may know that NIST 853 has its own um, uh, GitHub, government GitHub, and the ID that you have in your results will be traced back to the controls there. So um, in terms of the artifacts, so let's give an example, right? So all those catalogs and what we talked about, what, what, ex what exactly is, is, is that about? So if we start with the top layer, uh, we have uh, examples, I hope you recognize some of them, uh, regulatory compliance, they all can also be organizational policies. I make a differentiation here between capital P policy and small p policy because this term is overloaded and uh, when we are talking about things like NIST or HIPAA or the organizational big body of, of uh, requirements, right, we talk about capital P policies and in industry they are typically found out there as uh, PDF or spreadsheets format, and they are very difficult to be used in uh, programmatic interfaces or exchanges. So what OSCAL does, it takes that and um, allows to represent those as um, uh, uh, code as follows, right? So the, the uh, bread and butter of a regulation is its controls. So the controls are represented in, the, in OSCAL, in the OSCAL catalog or the OSCAL profile. OSCAL profile is a subset of the full catalog uh, with resolved uh, parameter values. So I'm selecting as a CISO, I'm selecting this particular baseline, I select the values and I represent that as a profile in OSCAR. Uh, now we are moving from the realm of regulation in the realm of technical um, um, area. So uh, we are talking in the uh, technology about um, rules, about technical controls uh, in terms of a particular um, uh, technology. So we know that uh, uh, Istio, right, has to be this or that way, that the pod has this uh, or those uh, restrictions. So we are talking about those policy rules. Again, this is small p policy. And um, in, uh, in OSCAL, we use the uh, uh, compliance as called OSCAL component definition to allow a vendor or a, you know, a, a service provider to represent the mapping between the controls in the capital P policy to the rules, the technical controls, right, um, for a particular product. Um, those are the, the technical controls, the items that we can validate, right? They are implemented, they may have APIs, they may have, uh, you know, YAML configuration that we can check and validate. The results from that, right, are represented in OSCAL in the OSCAL assessment result. Um, the um, bottom line, right, the, uh, uh, is about the, um, uh, in the case of uh, Kubernetes, we have a lot of uh, declarative code that, to express those policies. And we have an example here. So for SC28, which was my NIST control, we map to the unsure sensitive resources, right, which is the technical control within uh, the, uh, the Kubernetes pods. And then we have the representation, right, of the you know, descriptive declarative code down there. So to link it back to what we have today, in the uh, working group, in the policy result working group, we have this report that is done at the policy as code uh, level. So right when we go into the policy uh, code, we get out of the compliance as code realm and we move into the policy as code. So when Jaya was mentioning, or Robert, about bridging, right, the two, we are, we, we are looking at of having this linkage done across the stack so we are able to support automation. So what we do in the working group, we have a, a result that is harvested from the policy as code report and we translate it in the uh, assessment result format. So Jaya mentioned about the uh, uh, different personas. Uh, I know this is a lot. Hopefully when this is re getting recorded, you can look at them individually. But you see how the uh, OSCAL artifacts are mapped to those individual persona, allowing them to manage and to author those artifacts uh, without 
uh, you know, uh, walking on each other's toes. So the regulators are going to use the catalogs and predefined profiles. The control providers uh, will um, offer those um, component definitions with the mapping. System owners create the environment. They subscribe to, you know, the, the services deploy uh, uh, the clusters, define various scopes and associate with various profiles. PCI, HIPAA, whatever is of, uh, needed. Um, CISO will define the baselines, right, and the parameters that are need to be associated with those baselines. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, at the end of the day, if you do FedRAMP, you'll need a system security plan. And the goal to use those artifacts to generate the system security plan as much as possible in an automatic fashion. So now if we go from this realm of the compliance down into the PEPs, right, we'll have the assessments, uh, the uh, policy enforcement tools, uh, like Kiverno, the OPA gatekeeper, Falco, that will be the uh, source of those results. So what we have today in the working group, uh, you see in the continuous uh, pink here, uh, we support right, the obvious with the system owner right, creating those environments. Uh, we are able to collect the assessment results and next we are looking to be able to support the, um, the uh, specification of different profiles in order to, to help uh, bridge into the next level in the um, in the OSCAL framework. So here is an example of how the NIST, uh, 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 how they are uh, working with the policy result YAML is uh, uh, translated to the OSCAL, right? So you have the format of the YAML on the left and the OSCAL on the right. So to, to summarize, right? So these are the uh, uh, major points that, uh, that, that, that we have today in the, in the working group. And I think we are now ready to open for questions, right? Yeah, I think we had, are we at the end? <laughs> so I just want to invite everyone um, to attend our work group sessions. We meet every second Wednesday at 8 a.m. Pacific. Um, so in almost two weeks, uh, we'll have our next session. And of course, you can find our content on YouTube. We have a Slack channel. And uh, yeah, look forward to questions. So we'd like to open up the, to questions from the audience. And we have the, you know, the project perspective, we have the enterprise perspective, we have the developer perspective, and my perspective comes from the audit and compliance world. So um, any questions that the audience might have? Um, otherwise, we might have a little uh, back and forth here on the stage. <laughs> um, one I, I started off, maybe open up some of the questions. So I think it, it would be important to discuss what the challenge is uh, for managing policy at scale. And I, I think you know probably all of you here have some uh, perspective on that. Um, so whoever w wants to start, what are the, what is that the main challenge you see when you're really in the weeds trying to manage policy cl sure. across clusters? Yeah, I can give a quick perspective from what we're seeing and you know, so Nirmata, uh, my company, we also have a policy engine, Kiverno, which is one of the alternatives, you know, in terms of enforcing policies and then we provide governance and management tools around it. So what we typically end up seeing is, you know, first of all, keeping policies consistent across all clusters requires best practices like GitOps, et cetera, right? So you have to fall into that cloud native way of doing things. But typically within an enterprise, it's not just a matter of, you know, setting policies and then you're done and everybody's gonna be compliant. You need to manage policy exceptions in a flexible manner. So we have ongoing projects and things going on with that to be able to you know, have enterprise type workflows around that. So the right team and, and the, the big problem is how do you do that in a cloud native declarative manner as well. So those are some of the challenges we see and there are solutions emerging around that to manage at scale and certainly you know, like some of the things we're doing in the working group as well to allow that flexibility and make policies as well as the exception management declarative and manage everything as code. I, I could add to that, that um, I think the, the uh, problem that uh, Robert raises is one of the most difficult because it's a multi-dimensional problem. The scalability, right, is in, in a multi-dimensional uh, uh, domain. And um, besides the policies themselves, uh, we are looking at uh, the way that those policies uh, expose themselves in terms of being configurable or in terms of providing the results. So uh, being able as a uh, security and compliance uh, mm -hmm. provider to manage across such a variety of native interfaces is another dimension of this uh, 
um, uh, scalability. So this is where OSCAL comes into the place, and uh, I realize now I, I missed to uh, uh, discuss during the presentation um, so that we leave time for questions. Um, our open source uh, compliance project, Trestle, uh, where those personas um, get a collaborative platform to author their compliance artifacts via the interfaces of their choice. This is another problem, another dimension of this uh, uh, scalability. Um, compared to the operating uh, uh, operation team or the DevSecOps, where the type of skills are kind of uniform. When you go into the compliance, you go from the compliance uh, officer down to the developer, you have all the skills from working only with spreadsheets or working only with text or working only with code. So what Trestle allows those uh, personas uh, to manage the artifacts through the interface of their choice. So we support spreadsheet translation, marked out translations, uh, the type of translation that you have seen here from YAML to, uh, to the uh, JSON for OSCAL. And the key point is that uh, they are all maintained at, as the unit of um, uh, unified uh, common denominator, the OSCAL format. So any change is done in any of those formats, we maintain the, uh, the common denominator in OSCAL. So just to give you the uh, uh, feeling of the complexity of the, of the problem that Robert raised, many dimensions of this scalability. Yeah, I can add a few things, which is, um, so in my experience, one of the things I've found is that um, you can define policies and you can have rules by which the policies get deployed to manage clusters, but sometimes you have to customize, right? Because um, a given managed cluster may have one parameter that may be different, right? And you don't want to have to define yet another policy for it, right? Then you're going to have so many policies out there. So having the ability to templatize policies so that you can um, just define a policy and then include a te te the template includes some parameter that says, okay, use this secret from the managed cluster, or use this cluster claim, or uh, even a config uh, configuration. Um, I think that that capability is important, and I think that also helps with edge kind of use cases uh, to scale. Uh, the second thing I found is, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's not going to be a single policy language out there. There's going to be multiple. You know, Gatekeeper, OPA was getting a lot of traction, and then QNO is now getting traction, right? So we already have two. Um, and then there are all these security tools that are out there that are already supporting some of these capabilities. They have their own built-in rules and so on. So you need like a framework that allows you to integrate all these multiple policy engines. So I think that is another critical piece as well um, because you can't tell customers to just, okay, you need to adopt this, right? Because they may already be, have adopted other, th other things. So we need to be able to cater to that. And the other thing is, when you have all these different policy engines and they have their own policy files or YAML files, how do you quickly incorporate those? So having a generator capability that takes those existing Kubernetes configuration and policy files and then adds to it the OSCAL kind of component uh, definition and profiles um, so that you can then have the end policy, which is and refers to it as P, small p policies, deployed to the managed clusters. Having tooling to support that, those is, that is important as well. So these, all these capabilities exist today in the Open Cluster Management Project, which is a sandbox CNCF project. And it's also available in um, one of the Red Hat product offerings, uh, Advanced Cluster Management for Kubernetes. So, um, so we want to kind of bridge um, the, one of the things I'm also finding is, um, a couple of days ago, there was a talk I attended where I found that the SIG security is actually focusing on uh, mapping some of their security best practices into uh, NIST 853 and those kind of standards. And I think uh, what I'm seeing is, and I talked to a couple of customers, and they also mentioned this um, challenge of um, policy management and dealing with compliance and you know, even justifying you know, to their teams, why do I need to add an, at another policy, <laughs> right? Uh, being able to bridge that to business goals um, is, is a challenge for them. So I think um, the work uh, our group is doing, um, you know, tying that with the six security work and the OSCAL work, I think it's going to be a very important piece of work. Trying to provide a solution to the 
multidimensional <laughs> scalability problem well, in I, a I, standard I, way. And I'm reminded, literally, you know, sitting next to the river and, and the bridge, it's like there's this big gap between, you know, the developers who want to move fast and add features and functionality, and then kind of on the other side, the, the CISO and, uh, you know, regulatory folks, security ops, who want to make sure things are safe, right? And, you know, of course, reconciling those two, building that bridge is, is difficult. But not, if we have time for, for one more quick discussion, or qu we have a question. I, I can take this one. Um, so the um, compliance catalog, profile, all these artifacts, they are the same whether I'm looking at the um, content like infrastructure as code, right, that, um, uh, that I need to deploy, so pre-deployment artifacts, or the uh, runtime environment. Right? I'm, I'm following the same, I'm HIPAA or I'm, right? I'm not PCI left and HIPAA right. So the, uh, the uh, artifacts that we develop or the uh, personas that we are talking about, uh, author, are the same. What is different uh, may be the policy. So we go from compliance, we go into the policy realm. Now there is this uh, new approach, uh, especially that OPA is providing, where it is write once and use multiple times meaning that even the policy that I'm writing is the same, and I apply the same one left and right. Again, I'm talking about apples to apples, right? Infrastructure as code and, and the uh, environment that I deploy. If we are looking at the compliance of the pipeline itself, obviously it's a different set of you know, uh, rules and so on. But if we compare apples to apples, you want to write once and use multiple times. And this means that we bring the differentiation only at the level of abstraction of the evidence. And then all the rest we want to be the same. So it's another way to address the, the, the scalability of that because it, if at each layer I have another set of artifacts, another set of policies, it, it, it multiplies and the, I the think, problem. And I think, does, add, does it answer the question? Yes. Yeah. And to add to that, I think what we are saying is this approach can be applied not just during runtime, you can also apply it in the CICD pipeline, right? With the same artifacts, exactly, yes. So. And just one more thing to add to that, because I think, there, there's, especially for the supply chain, I mean, if anyone's actually looked at an SBOM and tried to you know, make sense of that, you, you quickly realize that you have to build out a, a tooling and a design that allows you to aggregate all this data and align it with policy with, with other tooling, right? So if you're talking about, I, we've seen some concrete examples of folks building out uh, catalogs or repositories of OSCAL component definitions, right, that declare, here are the policies that I support, here are the controls that I implement. And so I, we're hoping, or I'm hoping, that we get to a point where projects, sub-projects, um, and then vendors will continue to expose, here, here's the definition of what my system or product supports, here are the policies that uh, can be enforced either against this or with this, and, you know, it, comes, it becomes a very reusable uh, set of assets that then, you know, with other tooling, uh, I, I saw an example for uh, OPA where you can, you know, point it to any open API and then it'll generate policy based off of uh, logic and templates. So we, we get to a point hopefully where the policy rules themselves are being at least generated in template form and then, you know, different subject matter experts can go apply parameters or, you know, tailor it to the baseline and, mm -hmm. and the profile, so. Yeah, and that mapping between the standard and the policy, like Anka was also mentioning, is exactly one of the things we want to tackle next, is to say how do we create a catalog of that, or at least provide a means where folks can customize and build those catalogs. And we want to kind of do that in a more open fashion, right? Because right now what's happening is everybody is dealing with this problem on their own. So if you can standardize, and as Robert was saying, if, we can, if the technology providers also can collaborate and expose the parameters needed, right? Then it becomes easy for everyone. And to give you a, you know, a peek into the next, uh, uh, like, OSCAL uh, roadmap, uh, another uh, uh, scalability problem is that right now, if we have to provide uh, the 
as, you know, the assessment and the reports for uh, HIPAA or for PCI or for, we, we all the time or most of the time we start from scratch. So what OSCAL brings now is another type of mapping. So what Jim mentioning is between the capital P policy and small p policy, right? Regulation controls and policy. Uh, OPA is now, OSCAL is now bringing up a mapping uh, support between controls so that I'm able now, if I have the results for a particular regulation, to reuse the uh, evidence and the results for another regulation through this mapping. So yet another uh, solution, right, to the scalability when I have multiple yeah. policies. Well, well, thank you to the panel. Thank you for attending. And of course, Wednesdays, eight, uh, every other Wednesday, 8 a.m., hope uh, we see all of you there. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we're, we're happy to take questions here at the stage, or we can move outside if you had one-on-one uh, -on -one questions. Thank you. Uh, 12 o'clock at IBM. Uh, we have a uh, detail on Trestle, uh, detailing exactly that piece of the presentation that we had here on the IBM booth. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.